Here's the map of our presentation, going from the summary and its importance, deep integration, methodology, the challenges that we foresee, the strategies that we have begun to create to face those challenges. Our guiding question when it comes to summary and importance is how do we foster moral virtue in young children? Our answer to that, our proposed answer, is that we create a theatrical intervention that fosters moral character. The beauty of this is that theater itself is sensitive to the needs and skills of children. It's focused on the development, the use of the imagination, the capitalization on imitation, and the um, use of movement in particular. Coupled with philosophy and psychology then, it ends up providing us with a very innovative approach for moral education. So our project is really driven by a couple of key motivations. First and most importantly, a, a, a theoretical motivation. We want to study the beginnings of early virtue development and really we're interested in finding proto-virtues. And we see this as the, a feasibility study for a larger project that we hope to do down the road. Here we're going to be developing tools actual measures that we can use to try to find these proto-virtues, but also we're trying to identify a mechanism for the development of these proto-virtues, which we propose is going to be the practice of scripts. Second, and by no means less important, are practical motivations. Because both scripts and rituals are part of regular childhood play, we think that this will be a very valuable means of moral education that both parents and teachers can use. So we meet the challenge of deep integration by bringing together three separate disciplines, philosophy, psychology, and theater. And we really integrate the theoretical backgrounds of all three of those. We use them to develop the project and for each of the methods and measures as well. So we start with Confucian virtue ethics and a famous philosopher named Shunza, who really emphasized the role of ritual. And Shinza thought that rituals were absolutely essential for building moral character and were essential for developing moral virtue, which was a lifelong project. And for Shinza, rituals structure family, personal, and all social contexts. And as a simple way of explaining this, we can see this example here of a parent reading to his two children during story time. And we might think of this as an event of story time reading where there is a starting point, an ending point for the nature of the event. There is a structure for its activity, its sequence. Each of the individuals in, involved understand their role. The parent is doing the reading, the children are doing the listening, they're understanding the story. They understand that one of them reads at a time or maybe they change the reading back and forth. So they begin to learn both the process, the procedure, and the structure of this event itself. And it's because children learn those early scripts that they're able to coordinate their action with others. So here we have an example of children at a school. They are getting story time with their teacher and because, again, they all share the same exact script, they're able to sit quietly. They understand the starting time, the ending time, the structure, the sequence, how this plays out, and that the purpose of this is to listen to the story. As we grow and develop and mature, we see we can extend some of these scripts into broader contexts. So here we have students listening to a lecture, perhaps at a university or a classroom. Again, we understand the sequence of the event, the nature of the event, that we're there to listen to the speaker, that we hold questions, that we don't start tap dancing on the tables, uh, and we understand how Q&A sessions work. And so the overall event is structured by our implicit understanding of the nature of this event script. And so both in philosophy and psychology, we can use the notion of rituals then to think of them as something that we must practice or we must perform. And it is the very practice and performance of these rituals that really builds habits and dispositions. But most importantly, in both philosophy and psychology, we can make use of the notions of uh, scripts as forms of cognitive schema. And we can see this sort of implicit embedded knowledge that these children have in this example here. They're pushing a grocery cart. They understand how grocery carts are to be pushed. They understand the layout of the store, where to find various things. And notice they've been modeling adults in the sense that they even have learned some things to value. They both have bananas in their carts, for example. <laughs> so through this research in psychology and other background research, we understand that children and caregivers really co-construct scripts and stories as part of mutual play through all of childhood development. Caregivers then 
through their interaction with children, <coughs> that build this mutual responsiveness, which in turn builds um, conscience and empathy, a sense of self and conscience, by um, improving the child's attention and awareness. Psychologists also tell us that children who have greater social engagement um, or mu greater mutual responsiveness have, um, are better at social engagement and um, practice empathy. So the process then in, in virtue development is that through this mutual responsiveness, self-regulation, social-emotional intelligence um, are built up and the focus of our project is to um, practice proto-virtues via ritual. It's a seamless connection between theater, psychology, and philosophy. In theater, as all of you know, I'm sure, for centuries we've been emphasizing the importance of scripts and ritual play. One of the uh, most important innovators in recent history in theater is Jacques Copeau, who revolutionized acting training. His emphasis was on the importance of actors observing children. So actually, theater, in a sense, is rooted in child, children's play. And he thought that through ritual and through um, imitating children, children uh, actors could enhance their self-expression, their connection to the audience, and their bonding with other actors, forming a true um, ensemble. So we're also using these insights from theater to make use of a, a story or a legend or a fable. So on the back of your handout, you'll see a sample of the fable that we'll be using and practicing with the children, and they'll be performing this at the end of all of the intervention exercises. So continuing on with our methodology, then we have several hypotheses that we're going to be trying to uh, prove. First, we predict that parent-child mutual responsiveness will increase in both of the theater intervention groups because we're actively training the children in theater, we're using scripts and rituals that they're practicing, and so we expect that to go up. We also uh, have a hypothesis that the self-control scripts will be insufficient for fostering moral virtue. And there's many reasons for this, but one of the primary pieces that we're using comes from a, a text that James Rest wrote in 1983 where he points out that many criminals have a high degree of self-control and that self-enhancing character traits are insufficient uh, for fostering virtue, and we quite agree that self-control might be important, maybe even necessary for virtue, but by no means will it be sufficient. Our third hypothesis is that practicing these virtue scripts will promote moral virtue development. And this is because we think that virtues and the proto-virtues that we're looking at in particular are forms of embedded moral knowledge and that they are contained within the scripts and that children will be practicing them and becoming habituated and learning how to perform them. So we have several experimental conditions. There'll be two theatrical intervention conditions. So using the fable that you have on the back of your handout, there will be a variety of embedded scripts inserted into this general storyline. And so for the self-enhancing character promotion condition, those uh, children in that condition will have embedded scripts for self-control, grit, and determination. And for children in the moral character promotion condition, they will have the same story, the same fable, but different embedded scripts of kindness, gentleness, and forgiveness. And of course, our control condition uh, will be the children who receive no training in theatrical performance and also will receive no practice of scripts. They'll simply come together and play and work in other activities, and so that's our control group. Obviously, the theater exercises for both intervention groups will be the same. So both groups will be capable of self-expression, will practice social playfulness and mutual responsiveness between child and, and parent. The study design um, constitutes 72 mother-child dyads. In the intervention groups, there'll be 24 each, but we'll break those down into groups of 12 to facilitate um, theater training and we'll meet once a week for 12 weeks um, at, for 90 minutes. And we'll also be breaking the groups down into 12 so that as we go through the performance later, each of the children will have a role because otherwise if we have 24 dyads, not all the children will be able to participate. 
So condition number one is the self-enhancing character. And here the emphasis is really on achievement, it's on perseverance, and the idea is to develop character traits for self-control uh, and also to foster a sense of being the best, determination, et cetera. And we have several examples. We have three different types of uh, scripts that we'll be using, and we'll give you an example of each type. So the first is to inhibit uh, responses, and we have a whispering at the gate case, where there'll be a gate involved in the script, and children, if they whisper, the gate will open. But if they use their normal speaking voice, or they're shouting or screaming, it won't open. So this will be very easy to measure, to test, and to observe their successful performance of that task. Second is their ability to maintain their attention and their focus. So as they go through and practice performing the fable, uh, there'll be many uh, wonderful temptations such as cookies and treats all the way throughout which would be designed to tempt them and distract them. Again, it will be very easy to tell uh, if they have succeeded as to whether or not the cookies are gone or not. Uh, and of course, we're also going to be building on some of uh, Maccabee's research from 1965 using motor effort control. We're going to be using a, a classic case of walk the line where children have to coordinate their physical control uh, to be able to maintain and complete this task. In contrast, condition two, the moral character promotion will emphasize empathy and prosocial action. So one of the virtues that we'll be practicing in these scripts um, is kindness, which we define as the quality of being warm, friendly, and considerate. Within the script, there will be opportunities, for example, for the children to share water with someone who is in need of it. Gentleness is the second virtue that we will be incorporating into the script or into the overall fable. And it's the quality of being amiable, tender, and careful, um, one of the scenarios that we will be incorporating is a moment in which the main character needs to release a trapped animal and teaching that child to release that animal without harming it further is the practice of gentleness. Um, forgiveness is the third virtue, the quality of purposeful reconciliation. One of the characters will be bumped into, will nearly spill the water, she'll have to, to, he or she will have to forgive the person who has done so. So we have a variety of means for collecting the data. First and most importantly, we're going to engage in direct observation of both the children and the parents, uh, both in the theater exercises that Peggy will be running, as well as uh, collecting surveys, both pre and post, and journals. So we'll be looking at a variety of things for the parent-child mutual responsiveness. We'll be looking at the video recordings. We'll be looking at how the parents discuss this in their journal, changes in the children over time. We'll also be looking at parental characteristics such as well-being, family climate. We'll be using the surveys and the journals to gain that data. And we'll be looking at child characteristics by having the parents report, uh, giving their answers on the surveys, also making use of the journals and the parents' discussion of the changes in the child's behavior over time, and of course, our video recordings. Recordings. One of the challenges that we foresee is the brevity of children's attention spans. But again, the advantage of this um, intervention is that theater itself faces that challenge immediately. It's created by means of creative play, full body action, and shifting activities which are helpful for children to maintain their full attention. A second challenge we can foresee is the retention of the participants because they are young children. They're likely to get sick. Their parents' work schedules may change. And of course, their families may go on vacation. And so because of that, we've designed the study so it's very redundant in the sense that each time the children come, they practice the same scripts over and over and over again as part of this fable and the theater exercises. So attending three quarters of them will be sufficient for the level of practice we need. And we'll also be increasing the size of the incentives over time hopefully to maintain the parents' participation uh, in getting the children there and um, enjoying our theater activities. Any questions? <laughs>
you know? And uh, I even remember this in relation to um, reading um, Adventures of Tom Sawyer. At the end of that, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn says uh, to Tom, we have to hide our stuff here in the caves and because later on when we grow up to be uh, pirates, we'll have orgies here. And uh, Tom Sawyer, uh, Huck, you know, he says, what's an orgy? He says, I don't know, but pirates have a lot of them. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, um, so I have two questions. One is like, to what degree we think about development, because you have some of this in your uh, lessons, um, as inhibitory control. You talked about that. It's not just sort of enhancing gentleness or being kind to uh, animals that's, that's being worked on. It's also teaching scripts for children, like how to stay still in your seat, how not to take the marshmallows and things like that. So how strong is this picture of development um, in your in your model of these being these positive sprouts and you just have to like water and put us out in the sun and we grow into virtuous human beings as opposed to this other possibility that we're really a mixed bag from a moral point of view so the community has to do a lot of work and that relates to the, the theatrical interventions which is it just depends on you know sort of where a child's at about which character he I mean I guess you don't identify with the wicked witch as opposed to Dorothy but it's possible and um, so I, those are two general questions, thanks. I think there's like seven questions. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the first thing to say is we're really focusing more on virtues rather than vices because this is already a very large study with a great number of variables and quite a lot of effort and training for the children. And also from the standpoint of IRB, um, we don't want to really want to be practicing cases where we're training students or children uh, to develop vices. Right, so uh, we're focusing on positive virtue development uh, for these young children. But we are making use of inhibition of certain sorts of behavioral motor skills, right. and so we certainly would not classify any of those as vices. But for the theoretical perspective for where this is coming from, we're not making use of Mencius. Uh, Mencius has this notion that if you simply have moral sprouts, they're contained in one, you simply provide the proper social environment and moral virtue will develop. We're using Shunza because Shunza provides a stronger and more important role for ritual and more important role for the necessity of social interaction. And this is why we think that the parent-child mutual responsiveness is so important. Uh, and Shunza really ties in with that very nicely is because based on that work in psychology we can show our, well, their research in psychology has already shown and we're going to be hopefully be continuing it in this feasibility study that it's precisely because of the um, parent-child mutual responsiveness, the development of the socio-moral intelligence as part of habituated training and response that you end up with the capacity to practice the scripts and the pro overall positive performance, successful performance of the scripts, which wouldn't be possible without all of those other things already in place. Will Fleeson and Jennifer Hurt. That's a really good, uh, interesting, uh, neat, neat study. Um, one question I have for you is about uh, what seems to be a difference between a ritual and a the theatrical script, and that is, is that uh, rituals seem embedded in real life and about real life, while theatrical sc scripts seem inherently separated from real life. So I'm wondering if you have thought about that distinction and, and how you might overcome it, and if there's going to be an explicit instruction about connecting play, like separated, bracketed play to real life. Mm, great. That's a great question. May I take it? Sure. Okay. Um, I thought a lot about this because in theater it's incredibly important. We are dealing with three to five-year-olds who are with their parents. I think that there's a huge difference, for example, between three to five-year-olds and seventh and eighth graders who are beginning to, in a sense, need to make that distinction between the fictive life on stage and real life. For children at this age, really play is their life. So there is, it's more dramatic play that we are doing than actual fictional characterization, you might say. So thank you for that question. I think it's an important one. And added to that, I think, and thank you for that question, I think it also stems from a Western perspective that many of us have, where we think that ritual is something very disconnected from our regular lives. And we think that uh, practice and performance of scripts is something that's somehow separate in some way. And just as a simple example, we used uh, in, in the slideshow 
of knowing how to listen to a talk, a lecture, and story time. And we can even think of what we're doing here as the performance of a script. I guarantee it occurred to no one to come in and tap dance on a table, right? Uh, or to break out spontaneously in song in the middle of a presentation. Mm -hmm. So even though we don't think in the West of our actions as being highly ritualized, they are. And so what we're doing in this study is really bringing in uh, that work from Confucian virtue ethics and thinking about the importance of ritual, but also integrating it with psychology and blending the notion of rituals and scripts and pointing out that rituals really are a kind of performative script as well as instilling various cognitive scripts. So we're trying to show Yeah, actually I was accepting that, that ritual way. was part of daily life and wondering about the distinction between ritual and, and theater, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, good. Yeah. Well, so aren't you glad that Peggy answered your question? <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer. Very rich, Th thanks so much. Uh, I was interested in the way in which you're distinguishing self-enhancing character from moral character. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you talked about um, the notion that self-enhancing character might be necessary for virtue but not sufficient for it. But isn't that true of any proto-virtue? I mean, isn't that also true of everything that you're studying here? And so I'm wondering why you, you're, you're... Well, so in that particular slide, we were talking about the notion of self-control, right? So we might think that self-control will be essential for the performance of most virtues or any other virtue, because it'd be difficult to say that you can be gentle, for example, if you can't control various aspects of your own desires. But in that particular case, in that research, it's not just the notion of self-control. It's also determination. It's developing grit. And so these other things may also, in some cases, be important for virtue. Some of the folks in that research claim that it is. Uh, but we don't think that it would be sufficient. But I, So my point is that kindness and generosity on their own aren't sufficient for global virtue either. Oh, right. Absolutely. Nor is the, the form of kindness and generosity that you see in a three-year-old so that you know, doesn't qualify as a right. virtue. Exactly. Kind. And that's what we're calling these proto-virtues, uh, because we don't think that these are full-fledged virtues. I mean, no one would think that from the practice of giving someone water or releasing uh, or providing, you know, we were also using some other scenarios where you have to provide a coat or gloves for someone who's cold. No one would think that those are um, exemplars of gentleness or kindness but they are, would be instances of it, and that's what we're thinking of them as proto-virtues, the very earliest sorts of cases that we might be able to identify as being cases of that type, not that they themselves would be necessarily um, you know, primary examples of gentleness or kindness themselves, nor indicative of all forms of virtue. We're focusing just on those three. Dan. Uh, Deb, uh, or Peggy, uh, you're I was wondering if you were considered using uh, Kohanska's moral self-puppet interview as an outcome variable or as a mediating variable in, in your work, insofar as you're using her ideas about the uh, responsiveness between mother and child or parent and child. Mm -hmm. We haven't considered that, although that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I think, do you mind if I? No, no, please. I think one of the reasons we haven't thought about introducing that is um, because it introduces more level of complexity into the training and practice. So we're, we've got 90 minutes with the kids. Mm -hmm. We've got 12 groups of parent and children dyads. And that's a lot of people to contain. And mm -hmm. so we're getting them to work on the fable. And then we're also embedding the scripts. Mm -hmm. We're also teaching them theater practices, things like you know eye contact, how to read body language, uh, things like facing the front of the stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. Right. So Introducing any other elements to this, I, we haven't Perfect. considered that because I think the very complexity of what we're already doing is a bit daunting. Mm -hmm. uh, and Peggy will be in charge of really developing the activities for the children. I think we have time for one very quick question and quick answer. Uh, Michael, uh, in introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm, uh, oh, hi, I'm Michael Spezio. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the presentation. I have a quick question. I wonder, have you thought about the possibility that your children will value the practices rather than valuing the others, right? So basically, the virtue development is oriented toward developing a sense of self that values others instrumentally uh, and inherently. 
Um, and I'm wondering, given the structure and perhaps the uh, appreciation or uh, sort of uh, validation of the adults in the mix, whether the children will come away uh, with valuing the practices but not the others. And the reason I suspect that this might be the case is because uh, actors who are trained in these methods, um, they have great emotional control. They even have great emotional openness to others while they're on stage, as uh, Ed Norton's character in Birdman kind of uh, demonstrates. But, uh, and this is no slight on actors, they are not necessarily virtuous exemplars. I mean, just I was going on a little bit. I ask a question to do with this. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you bring that up because the, mm, the theorist that I mentioned, he's also a practitioner, was a director and was famous for creating an ensemble that based its living theater on communal life that stressed basically um, an emphasis on relation to the other, a sense of service, of bonding in a community that demanded selflessness. So his whole definition of acting was that the actor gave the gift of expression to the audience and to be able to do that um, and to also be able to participate in an ensemble and not just attract attention to my star self, you had to be the kind of person who is capable of that set of virtues in real life. Very demanding. Not much lived. <laughs> 30 seconds for an addition. So in addition, uh, don't forget that we're also making use of the theater training exercises and mutual responsiveness itself where we're teaching them to engage in eye contact to respond to the emotions that the other one is using. Uh, and so that is partly designed to mitigate that kind of concern. We would never have phrased it in that way though um, because I don't think that for the activities that the children are doing, which is inherently cooperative, and as they come each week, they're going to be exchanging different roles. You know, for example, one of them will be the person who bumps the other. And so they're working together this entire time. Um, I think few adults would probably even make the leap to thinking of them as being instruments for means of uh, some character performance. Thank, Thank you very you. much.